J.D. Davis, fast you've become one of the most popular Mets. I mean, that's happened seemingly like that. And we told you if you came on this podcast, it would be worth your while. So we're going we're gonna to make you even more popular right now, okay? All right. We did some research. It's going to help us Q rating. That's what I'm saying. Now, your favorite player growing up was none other than David Wright? Yeah, one of them, yes. There you go. Tell us why. Uh, you know, I was always a third baseman, so, you know, uh, I just like, I always kind of gravitated towards the guys that, you know, weren't the, uh, I would say in the bad media, or just kind of those guys that set a good example for them. They weren't, you know, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It was just, you know, like kind of like Derek Jeter or like David Wright, you know, those guys, like a Scott Rowland, you know, guys that are good on the field and then just quiet off the field. They're, you know, good good teammates, good examples. Um, I, I just like those kind of guys. So. See, this is something that you should have let be known. You should have had a – you should have come to spring training wearing a David Wright jersey. It would have happened even quicker <laughs> yeah, than it's happened right I, now. I, I don't really like – That would go know. again, fly in the face of what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's true. <laughs> have you talked to David? Has he uh, yeah, had a, a, yeah, some I said, conversations? Yeah, I said hi to him here and there and, you know, just, you know, what's up. But uh, he, he uh, pops his head in here and there in the clubhouse or says hi. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I haven't really had a full conversation with him. But uh, it's been So he cool. doesn't know this. He'd have, unless he's a I, loyal I hope, listener to Randall, I hope not, because that would be really weird. Just from now on, after just knowing that he was one of the guys I kind of looked up to, and then now meeting him, and then you know maybe go out to dinner with him or something like that, it'd be kind of a little awkward. But it's it's all right. What do you think it takes to be a guy like that, or Jeter, or Scott Rowland, any of those guys you mentioned? Um, you know, I think uh, first things first is n- is knowing the game, having a high baseball IQ, um, and then also obviously loving the game, and then third, being a good team. Um, I think if you follow all those three things, then um, you kind of, you know, just you know, you keep keep your garden trimmed, and you know everything's going to be all right. And uh, you know, uh, uh, foremost, you care care more about your teammates than yourself, and then uh, playing the game the right way. So um, I think those those three things are you know great, and uh, you know those three things those guys really follow by. I feel like so. Uh, you clearly have have been that type of a guy since you've come here. Is that something that you had innately and you just kind of gravitated towards those type of players watching those type of players or was it something instilled in you by a parent a coach somebody that that really let that be known early on that it's less about the individual and more about the collective yeah um, I think it was just you know growing up with um, with my my dad and then obviously him being my coach going on and then you know as coaches go along you know going from uh, high school and, co- and uh, college of just having those coaches uh, coach uh, Jeff Carlson and uh, Rick Vanderhoek of you know just te- you know again teaching more of the game and being a teammate than you know being an individual and you know being this you know a game is um, you know nine individuals make up a team and so everyone can get caught up in you know their own stats or their own anything so it's just uh, I think playing the game the right way they've taught me that um, and I think just learning from others, um, others' mistakes and, you know, what, what good choices they've made during their career. And that's if, you know, present um, right now or in the past of going through the minor leagues of guys that have, you know, made bad decisions. Um, you know, it's not bad decisions like going out and partying or anything like that, but just bad decisions like um, having a conversation with somebody or calling a teammate out or, you know, just those kind of things where, um, it helps out with the culture of the team. Of you know, you don't want to be, you want to be a voice. You want to be there for your teammate, but you don't want to be a distraction as well. So I just I feel like that's you know kind of my thing. And you know, uh, you know, I, I always like I always like being a little more animated or having a little fun on the fo- on the baseball field. But yeah, I think there are a few. Uh, what is, is it? Gifs or is it gifs? Do, do you have a, I think a, the guy who uh, I have no created idea. it calls it a gif, but everybody calls it a, a gif. Yeah, I mean, there's I there's like one a game of you now. Yeah, yeah. I, You're very you, <laughs> full of expression. I, I love being, you know, being animated. I love cheering for my teammates. I love being a part of the team, you know, just being around the guys. And then it's I'm the complete opposite when I'm, you know, off the field. I'm more quieter. I kind of stay out of it. It's like staying in my room, you know, staying with the guys or whatever, just kind of laying low. So uh, it's kind of bipolar back and forth, you know, a little bit or flip of the switch. Is the sport itself embracing more of that now where guys can be uh, more expressive about scoring or hitting home runs where it's not as much showing up the other team as it is celebrating your own? 
Um, yeah, I think there's more of a youth movement going on right now where it's like back in the, or I wouldn't say back in the day, but say, you know, four or five years ago, you see guys, you see so many older players come in and they've been raised, not even not raised, but like they've been, um, you know, exposed to more of the old school way where it's just like, you know, that, that monotone kind of emotion. And so um, I feel like these uh, younger generations coming through, you know, you see, you know, Javi Baez, you know, you see the Dominican Republic, the Venezuelan guys coming in and they show this flair, they show this excitement in the game. And so, and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to be a part of. Um, and, you know, uh, I think it's, you know, credit to them and credit to the younger generation coming up that, you know, it's just, I feel like guys just not the fact that the old guys didn't love the game, but the guys that come up here, I just feel like they just uh, it's, it's a little bit more I wouldn't say emotional, but they just um, they kind of let the moment go, get get away from them. They kind of express themselves in a little bit more way. Can it be irritating at all, or, or do you even hear some of the older players that kind of denigrate the game now that say, you know, maybe back when we played, you know, Goose Gossage is famous for that. But you hear it with different broadcasters and, and ex-players that say, you know, the game has changed to a point where it's unrecognizable, maybe unattractive to us. Did, does that bother you as a current player in today's game? Uh, not really. Because, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's about, you know, just the team and, you know, the group of guys. So that's all I really like, care about. I care about my coaches, I care about my teammates, I care about the, the training staff, the medical staff, like those, that inner circle, um, you know, I, I feel like that's part of what makes a good teammate is making sure that, you know, everybody else around you, you know, you, you I wouldn't say make them better, but, you know, just um, be there for them as a good teammate. And, you know, again, like I always try to be animated or try to, you know, try to make some jokes or anything, like make everybody smile. So I feel like that's the way it is. But, you know, I feel like there, there's, there's a fine gray line with the old school and the new school way where guys are, you know, that monotone and that emotional kind of or express themselves so uh, I think it just uh, depends on what kind of you know manager or what kind of I would say people in front of you kind of thing like Joe Madden Joe Madden has so many so many uh, 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 personalities on that team and so he just kind of just sits back and lets them play so but then you got you know uh, not anything bad but you got like a Buck Walter. you got like who, who's, who's the Pirates manager I forgot uh, Clint like, Hurdle Clint Hurdle yep. you know you got got that got that mean face on him so it's just uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 a little bit different but uh, but yeah uh, Mickey's doing a great job with us and he's got plenty of personalities in there especially with uh, Frazier and all that. Well, I was going to say, when did you realize coming in to not just a new organization, but as a young player with a lot of young players around, when did you realize that you guys would have that freedom to be not just expressive, but start to take on a leadership role? This, there is a, a young contingent here, but you also have some established veterans. You have your Canoes, your Frasers, guys like DeGrom that are in that clubhouse. What is different about this room that allows you, Dom, Pete, to really start to take over at times and show your personality. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't really know anything about you know the last couple of years, but um, I know being on the Astros and looking or playing on them on the opposite side of the line is that Mets have always had such an older kind of kind of group of guys or older leadership in a way, and so there is there they uh, I wouldn't say they lacked, but it was more like this the they lack the younger kind of group coming up through the system. Um, when you see, you know, other franchises have such great success, you see, um, you know, uh, Giants did it with, you know, Buster, Madison, Bumgarner, um, you know, you got Crawford, you know, all those guys that, you know, that young group that kind of failed early but came together and then finally like kind of just blossomed and they came at the right time. They won world, they won championships, they won, um, they you know, they brought multiple championships home for their, uh, for their city. Um, and then you see, you know, you see Boston, um, you see the Royals, you know, you see those kind of things. Um, I don't know if there's an, ex an exact date or if there's an exact moment, but I think during spring training, um, as the roster started to um, kind of minimize or kind of, you know, what, um, uh, all of us younger guys were still kind of in the room. I remember always we always go out to dinner or, um, or lunch or whatever. We always talk about, you know, there's an opportunity for us um, to kind of step in and take, an, take this – uh, team kind of not, not to another level, but we had an we had an opportunity to change the culture 
um, in, in a way where, you know, we can kind of take over and be a part of something special and, you know, kind of bring something for New York and for the franchise as well. Um, obviously, Pete um, has, has done his fair share in this <laughs> game of baseball this year. So, uh, but we, you know, we talk about it all the time and, you know, we talk about team, we talk about just the camaraderie, talk about the guys, the culture and how, you know, just playing hard, running down to first base. But, um, you know, that old school kind of uh, vibe around the clubhouse where, you know, if you're a young guy that comes up, you, you sit in your locker and you stare at your locker. You're not allowed to look at anybody. That, that old school, like you, you earn your stripes. And so, um, you know, learning from the Astros, going from them and coming over here and kind of that, um, not necessarily carefree, but just like, all right, if you're up here, you know, contribute, do your thing. Um, be part of the guys, be part of it, because if the more that you can open up earlier, the more that you can um, feel comfortable up here, then the more success you're going to have. Like, for example, you see the Dodgers, you see every young guy come up there. And I, I, I've never been in their clubhouse, but I know some of the, at least some of the guys over there and at least the personalities. And you see all those young guys that come up and it's like they don't even miss a beat. I uh, one I I was just curious how their clubhouse is and uh, I know for you know T uh, Teresa told me the other day that they're coming in um, and every pregame they're having New York pizza for uh, pregame. <laughs> Teresa's well, the team chef. For team chef, yeah, yeah, team chef. So it's just like, would that happen to us? Probably not. Like, but it's just that kind <laughs> of um, that uh, spontaneous kind of fun kind of young atmosphere that they have over there and this and we always talk about that of what we can provide or what we can set the bar for the younger guys or the future generation like you know like the like Sam Haggerty coming up like some guys that are coming up we can not necessarily take them take them under their wing or take them under our wing but like just you know help them feel comfortable that way they can show their instincts and show their talent quicker well that's what I was going to ask specifically about Sam Haggerty and you know right now if you're listening to this podcast we're taping it Friday right before the game first game of the Dodgers series uh, but a few games ago it really stood out to me when Sam Haggerty got his first major league plate appearance in a blowout game everybody was still in the dugout everybody was on the top step of the dugout and you guys were clapping cheering him on getting the crowd into it is that a prime example of what you're talking about yeah and that's exactly what we're trying to talk about was that you know even though there's so many teams or that um, uh, kind of situation where it's 10 nothing everybody can kind of just you know flip the switch off or turn it in or some guys you know after they get called out of the game just go back in the go back in the clubhouse you know look in the look at their computer or just kind of check out and not care who goes into the game um, and uh, it's part of that culture that we're talking about is that you know we care for one another that we care about the game um, you know and I think it was just a moment where it's just like you know it is a big moment for him and we wanted to make it you know special for him um, and you know just cheer him on because you know he he hasn't played that much since he's been come up here and I've been in that same situation where you know it's tough and so all of a sudden you get a in a bat I mean what, what day is it he's been here since I mean, what, what, 12 14 days so yeah, he hasn't really that, had yeah. much of a live yeah, AB right. so it's just like um, you know we just wanted to cheer him on and we wanted to have his back and if, if you know if he got out or if he got a hit you know we were still going to be the same way and you know just cheer him on I know he's going to get in a bat here soon again so hopefully he gets it gets it gets his first hit so you know it's your first full year in the major leagues it's Pete's it's McNeil's you know what does it say about the future of this organization to have you guys succeeding, coming together, making a playoff push, and all doing this in, in just your first years? I think it's it, the future is bright for us, and uh, it goes back to like some, you know, you're talking about Boston, you're talking about Kansas City, you talk about uh, the Astros, you talk about all this, these teams that have gone this young group, and they've, uh, they've gone through these struggles together into then finally like blossoming. I know uh, McNeil's hitting like 330 or whatever, and Pete's hitting 48 home runs. But um, uh, but just to like kind of have this experience, like I've always said, to have this young group exposed to you know the Nationals early in the year, a huge series where the crowd was just going crazy. To have us exposed to that such an early part of the season or at such an early part of our career that it's only going to help us, um, you know, kind of get us better in the bright lights or in playoffs or in a big spot situation. So I feel like the future is bright with us. 
Um, we always talk about it. We always talk about, you know, being in situations, playoff situations. We're always, you know, just, I don't know, we just guy talk, you know. But it's uh, it's been pretty fun, and we know that the future is bright with us. Um, it's just, you know, uh, we just got to keep working at it. Why do you think those moments haven't seemed too big for you guys? Uh, I think just the communication part of us, you know, when, when we fail, like where you go back in the clubhouse after the game or we go going back to the hotel and we, we, we talk about it. You know, we, we, we laugh about it if we get out or if we, we, we get on or whatever, we joke about it. Like, I think we just kind of, um, it, it's kind of cool how us young guys kind of just dissect the game or dissect the situation or the moment and uh, just again if, if it happens to me then someone else like like Jeff or uh, or Damo or someone or Conforto will he'll learn about me failing or in that situation or in that or during that pitcher and um, it just I don't know it just kind of we learn from our own failures and we, we learn from our own success and you know we thrive on each other it's pretty cool a lot of people see your approach to the game and, and they know your background with the Houston Astros. Was that just a good fit for you because of how you are or have the Astros made you the way that you are? Uh, kind of both. Um, you know, uh, the way that I look at the game um, or the way I play the game was, you know, it's, it's, that's based upon the coaches of my, my dad and my past coaches. But to go into like the baseball IQ kind of level of the preparation, the atmosphere kind of thing. That was, I think that's more of the Astros in me of, you know, learning from some of like the best guys in there. And like I've, I've, I've told you where Justin Verlander, he'll, he'll start. And then those four or five days that he's on rest, he's basically looking at guys through video of, you know, zones of where he doesn't or where that the weaknesses of that opposing hitter so I you know that kind of opened my eyes is that you know this guy's going in the Hall of Fame and he's prepping more than anybody so I was like if he's doing it might as well I'm doing it like you know and then you see Jose Altuve going in there and studying for an hour and it's just like there again this is what I'm talking about the culture of how the bar is being set by these superstars, these these uh, great baseball players, of how they approach the game, um, and so if you know if Jose Altuve and JV are doing it, you might as well be doing it too. So that's what I'm talking about: creating this culture, creating this this. Everybody loves the game, but to go into it, that's it's just another level. You are someone who I know we've talked about this. You always had confidence that it would happen for you up here. Um, but obviously, you were blocked in Houston when you did get playing time. It was sparse, and you didn't necessarily have the opportunity to take full advantage of it. Was there a moment for you this year where, or even this offseason before, had there ever been a moment where you started to think, like, ah, maybe, maybe this isn't going to happen? What were the expectations, I guess, for you coming into this season new organization um you know i i would say it's not gonna ha i would go to the first part of that question i would say more of it towards the end of uh 2018 with the astros where it was just you know it was it was just bad luck after bad luck you know it was bad at bat after bad at bat um there was really no you know sign of you know turning the corner over here and it, i just wasn't being fair to myself um, and then coming over here to the Mets, um, you know, I've always talked about how you're playing for uh, 29 other teams when you're blocked, like, you know, with a superstar Alex Bregman in front of you. There's really not, not much wiggle room with him. Um, so I think that just kind of helped me have some, I wouldn't say hope, but just kind of drive that, you know, this, because I'm a very goal-oriented guy. And so when I have a goal, like, I'm just, I'm, I just go, I, I'm, it's tunnel vision, right? So um, knowing the fact that there's 29 other teams and there was a possible trade coming up that I just, you know, 2018, whenever I was down in AAA, I just, you know, I just played hard. I, I you know, I had fun. Um, and then in the major leagues, it was kind of, it was kind of tough. Um, and then, uh, but coming over here to the Mets, I felt like it was a fresh start. It was kind of like my opportunity where I can, you know, get in at bat every day or get a start every other day. Where with the Astros, it was, I, I, I've told you plenty of times when I got called up in September, I sat the bench for 16 straight days, just like, you know, a little bit with Haggerty going on right now. And it's tough. It's tough to get in a groove right there and then, then expect, you know, myself to, to get a hit and then me to be unfair with myself, not get getting a hit. Um, so uh, coming over here to the Mets, you know, it was kind of like a fresh start for me. Um, and, you know, just talking to the other guys with the Astros or some guys with the Astros, you know, my dad, 
Um, they just told me, you know, there, there was a, it was funny, Brian McCam, he told me, it was like, uh, he came down for his rehab start in AAA, and when I, then I got called up to the big leagues, and he's like, dude, like, you completely act totally different in AAA and in the big leagues. Like, AAA, you act like what I'm doing, like, right now, animated, have fun, have fun with the guys, joke around, and when I go up to the big leagues, I'm like, this mouse, I'm quiet. Like, and it's just like, he's like, just, you know, like, you know, just, um, you know, be yourself, go have fun. And so I think that, again, that credits to what the Astros had over there, that the older guys were just like, be yourself, be, you know, who you are. And so having, having this fresh start over here, I just wanted to, you know, um, kind of just come in and, you know, really show my, my color, show my personality, have fun with the guys, not, uh, not, not be a mouse, I would say, but, uh, <laughs> but just, again, just ask questions um, and, you know, not be afraid of failure and just have fun out here. You had a game earlier this year against Washington where you took Patrick Corbin deep twice? Mm -hmm. Twice. So, and you said that was a turning point for you. Why, why did you think that was a turning point? Uh, you know, he, you know, Pat, you know, Corbin, he's been, he was a top left-handed market guy. So obviously when you have that prestige, like he's uh, Patrick Corbin, right? So it's like, yeah. and at the beginning of the year, I had, again, I had a lot of bad luck. I don't know what the, well, it was two for 12, two for 20, whatever it was. But, uh, you know, I, I hit some balls hard, just I had some hits robbed. And so it's kind of like that. Like, all right, here we go here again, we go you know, again. here we go again. Like, come on, when's this going to turn the corner? And so, uh, you know, talking to Chile, I think it was after that Miami series, we came home, we faced the Nationals. We worked on some stuff. We really just took a step back and really, like, just calmed everything down, um, got back to some of the, the rhythm, some of our, you know, checked our P's and Q's. And then I just kind of, I think just those at-bats, it was just kind of, I was just locked in. And uh, obviously hitting two home runs off one of the top left-handed uh, guys from the off season, um, really, you know, just a confidence booster, I would say. And, you know, I, I think everybody knew from when the Mets acquired me was that I was a lefty specialist. Mm -hmm. So here it is, here's this lefty, you know, great lefty coming in and I'm supposed to be doing my job, I'm batting fourth. So it's just like, it was a little bit, you know, uh, uh, a little overwhelming. I was just like, all right, I gotta do, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. Come on, we gotta turn the corner. So um, I, I think just applying all the work and putting everything together, and then all of a sudden hitting two home runs off of him, um, and just winning the game. You know, it was just an overjoy moment. It was just a big, you know, turning point where I just turned the corner and. I don't know, I just settled in from there and, you know, worked with Chile and from there I just kind of took off. So you said everybody knew you were a lefty specialist. Did you think you were a lefty specialist? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, didn't really I didn't really like that tag or that little uh, <laughs> emblem because, you know, I don't know, I, just, I always strive to be the best hitter that I can be or the best player that I can be. So all of a sudden you just put a label on someone that says you can't do something or you can't hit a righty. So it's just like, I don't know. We'll see about that. So <laughs> it's, um, but no, I, again, uh, you know, uh, I, I thrive off lefties. I like them. I don't know why I like them, but um, I, I like facing righties as well. I think it keeps my, you know, front shoulder in and it keeps me locked in. So that way when I do face a lefty, like it's just, it's, it's even better. You know, I don't know what it is right this second, but at least as of a couple of days ago, your splits were identical righty. I think you were hitting 303 versus righties, 303 versus lefties, and slugging percentage mm -hmm. was exactly the same too. So I think that's out the window. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I just take pride in that. I, I, again, I take pride in being the best hitter I can be. Um, you know, I, I come to the game, I come to the field every day just trying to, again, have fun, be, you know, laser focused, tunnel vision, and, you know, have fun with the guys and, you know, just, again, do my job and have fun with baseball. You know, Steve and I grew up in cold weather America. We played baseball in June, July, and August, and that was pretty yeah, much it, it was right? Cold at points, you know. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, growing up, you know, we here grow up in California. Obviously, there's a lot of Californians on every major league roster. Is is it legit? Are you out there in December, January, November? Are you are you out there playing ball 12 months out of the year? Um, probably in Southern California. In Northern California, we get a little bit more rain. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get. Uh, We'll get about two or three days of sunshine during during the weeks during winter, um, and that way it just you know again it, we could still go out and on turf fields and hit and take ground balls do whatever, um, but uh, but yeah it's a little bit easier in the Southern California where they it's like it's like Arizona they play every day and it's ridiculous. So. Was it uh, always baseball for you, or are you one of these guys that played all sports and and you know eventually? 
baseball became the one. Yeah, so I was I grew up always playing three sports: football, baseball, and basketball. Um, and uh, it was mainly baseball and football. Um, and then uh, it was my my going into my junior year, um, and we we're it was like a game right before the first week of this first week of the season. It was like an inner squad and uh, I ended up getting like sacked or I don't even know what it was. I was scrambling and I, my foot got caught up and uh, I ended up breaking my leg, my tibula and my fibula. And um, it just, I don't know, it was just at that point where it was just like, I was, I was pretty pissed off that I was gonna miss the football season. Um, and then I had to get ready for baseball season. And there was like a moment where, you know, my dad was just like, all right, well, um, do you want to still play two sports or do you want to just concentrate on baseball? Because we have this opportunity where we can get better in baseball. You never really had an, a real true off season to concentrate on baseball because you've always been playing football. Um, and so I was just like, all right, let's do it. You know, I, you know, at the time it was a little bit easier to say, you know, you know, bye to football. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I still miss those Friday night lights, Saturday, you know, Sunday, you know, I, we always play the what if thing. It's pretty funny. Um, well, how good are you? Could you have played uh, on Saturday or Sunday? I was all right. I think I was better as <laughs> Your a brother kicker. does, right? I, yeah, yeah, he does. He's over in Minnesota right now. He's playing. He's an offensive guard right now. He's, 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 he's got the height and the, and the size in the family. <laughs> he's like 6'5", 3'10", or something around there. So he's, he's a monster. Um, but, yeah, I still, again, go see him over there in Minnesota, and that's what you call Minna, Minna snow snowda yeah right <laughs> that's that's cold yeah. so it's not uh, northern california no that's no, wild no. though by the way like i mean two in the same family yeah i mean you know to have two brothers that are are that good athletically is it because <laughs> of each other like do you think you guys push each other or is <laughs> yeah. it your father <laughs> just freak genetics I mean, uh, <laughs> you know my, my dad was you know he played he played baseball and my mom was a swimmer. Um, uh, you know, there wasn't, there are no freak athletes, but I think it was just set the standard set by my dad. We were always competing in everything we did in, you know, in pool basketball and wiffle ball growing up or um, anything, you know, we were always competing. Um, I think we just thrived on each other's success and failures. Um, you know, we always, I always, uh, I just talked to him again last night. Like I, we're always, to, we're always very close. Um, uh, you know, it just, I don't know, we just help each other out. And again, like he, uh, we work out together in the off season when he comes home from Minnesota and here, and we just, I don't know, we just kind of push each other, you know, just that brotherly love kind of thing, so. Did I ever tell you what JD told me about his off season workouts the last two years? I don't think so. You should, I, I did the story on air, but just in case everybody wasn't watching in that moment. <laughs> that, I mean, you're a lunatic. I'm just gonna flat out say that. You, you've you been a lunatic the last couple of years yeah. with what you've done. Yeah, so you, you, you wanna talk about the, the hard days or the, or the, the easy hard day? <laughs> the hard days. So like hard days is usually like a, uh, I usually keep it like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Monday, Tuesday, Saturday. So we'll go like a Tuesday. So I wake up, I don't know, eight o'clock, I uh, have my workout from 10 to 12. Um, and then I'll, I'll come home, you know, regular, eat lunch, take a shower, and then I'll have another workout at like usually two or three o'clock. And that's so the 10 to 12 is usually strictly weight training, a um, little bit of plyometrics. Uh, it's it, it's mostly str it's mostly strength, and then from I usually have a two to a three or a three to a four workout, um, and that's strictly plyometrics and agility stuff. And I've been going to that guy for quite a while now, just high school, Alex Van Dyke, over there in Sacramento, and. He, he wears me out. It's, just, it's, just, it's basically you're just constantly running for, for an hour. So, um, and then I come home um, and then usually uh, I just eat dinner and then I'll actually put on a, like usually like a sauna suit or like a, me uh, a, uh, a weighted vest. <laughs> And I'll have my girlfriend, my girlfriend will get pissed off because she doesn't want to run. So I was just like, all right, well, I'm going to go run. Because at that point, like, I, I always, you know, I, I'd work on my feet. I'd work on, you know, just getting lighter. That's at third base. And so I would, you, you know, jump rope for, you know, about, you know, five, ten minutes. And then I would go on a run around the neighborhood. And usually it'd be about two, two and a half miles with the weighted vest on. And just, yeah, I don't know. I, I loved it. I, I, so I would be doing. Yeah, it sounds really fun. I, yeah. And then as we get closer to spring training, usually before that run I would go hit at my at my friend's house and then from his house I would just basically run home <laughs> why just the last couple of seasons what what kicked uh, that into gear I think you know I think it just had to do with weight management I was getting in 2016 
I was getting, I was pushing a little bit, like 235, and so I was just like, I, 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 I got to get down. I, I got to lose a little bit of weight. So, and then it was, you know, going into Double A, um, it was kind of, a, you know, I, they always say Double A is kind of like closer to the big leagues with velocity, and it's kind of like the big step in which a hitter takes another another step into becoming a better one or closer to a major league hitter. So it was kind of a big year for me. So I just wanted to prep that year, and I had success in that year. So I was just like, I'm, I got to keep the same thing. So it also might have been that you know Verlander and Altuve showed him how to do something that <laughs> he wanted to show them how to yeah. have an off season. Yeah. They really yeah. wanted to set the standard. Yeah. You know, you've mentioned third base like 20 times, I think, in this interview. Is this still your goal? Do you want to be an everyday major league third baseman? Yeah, you know, that's what I was. You know, that's what I was drafted as, and that's what I have put mostly my time into this, into pro ball is as third base. I know Frazier's over there. You know, David Wright was there before him and you know they've they've set the bar extremely high and you know I've said this to you before the New York Yankees their gem is is shortstop and new over here in New York Mets is the third base so and that's you know I think that just speaks louder of what you know David has, has done for this franchise and what how much success he's done um, and so I don't know I mean if 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 I don't get the opportunity to play third base I'm, I'm not I don't know if I'll lose that much sleep but I, just the opportunity to play up here in the big leagues then that's that's all for me you know left field right field third base first base well, not first base anymore but <laughs> um, but you know it just yeah, talk about it, being blocked oh man <laughs> right so uh, but yeah I mean I, I've always liked third base but you know I could always play left or right wherever the team needs me um, before we let you go and I know you guys want to have many more moments like the mm -hmm. ones you've had in the second half here. But have you had a, a favorite moment thus far this season? Um, you don't say Brad Hand, you're lying. No, man. That was, <laughs> I was, I was going to say that. I was going to say either, you know, um, I was going to say the two home runs off Patrick Corbin, um, the walk off Brad Hand, and then, um, you know, the back-to-back -back, um, home runs with me and Pete off of uh, Strasburg. Mm. I would say that was just because of the atmosphere of what it was. It was uh, the uh, the walk off. Yeah. Uh, for I mean everybody I'm assuming has has seen this interview on the field with me. All right. It's they've made it a, a pump up <laughs> video now. Is just your essentially wrestling promo that you cut <laughs> to the fans. We did it again. I want I want to get inside your head right there because I watched that back the other day and I was in the middle of a question and you were you were doing this like you were just giving the microphone. But yeah, you didn't need me out there. You, I just I should have handed it off. <laughs> oh man, that was that's just me, you know. Uh, what I've always talked about flipping a switch where it's just the intensity, the energy where it's just uh, you know I, I was I was I was just blown away at the moment you know just having a nine pitch at bat against you know one of the best closers and coming through for the team um, uh, it was a dream come true to have that opportunity and come through for my first walk off you know I was absolutely pumped and then obviously the fans were going nuts um, and I think we still had a sellout crowd at that point when we had the Indians here and it was. I don't know. It was just one of those. Hey, it was great. It was I was over. I was happy to be an observer. <laughs> just, here you go. Take, yeah. The next walk off you hit, I'm right. just I'm <laughs> handing it off. <laughs> What's uh, what about that at bat with hand though? What 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 were you thinking as that was unfolding? I mean, nine pitches, you fouled a bunch off. I think you had your 0-2, right? And yeah. You came back to make it 3-2. What, what's just what's the thought process uh, through that? I can't give you that many, that many <laughs> details just in case I face them again, World right? Series, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, you know, just going back, doing my homework on him, you know, of what he likes to throw or like what he likes to set up his slider. Um, as you guys saw, he, he, he got a, I, I was taking OO all the way. I wanted to see what he was going to do. If he was going to challenge me with the fastball, if he was going to, you know, throw me that slider. And if he threw me that slider, it was probably a, probably a good thing, just for the fact is that I got to see it right away. And it was probably one of the better ones or, you know, a pitch that later on in that at bat, I would look for where it started. Um, and he ended up doing that. He ended up flipping a slider OO and then, uh, um, I got down 0-2. I don't know what the second pitch was. I, I can't really remember. I think it was a slider again or a fastball. Um, and during that hole at bat, I was just like, you know, if he, you know, throw, he, he likes throwing fastballs in later in the count, so that way you can get your hips, you get your shoulders going earlier, and that way he can break off that slider. That way you're more jumping at the baseball, you know, you're more anxious, and that's what he usually gets guys out, um, you know, chase down. And so in that hole at bat, you know, I was just like, I went to my two strike approach, got my foot down early and basically just gave him the corner on the inside. If he, if he painted that fastball in, then I was just like, I was just gonna tip my cap. I was like, all right, dude, because if I swung at that pitch, 
I probably would have either rolled over to third base or fouled it off, and that way it would it'd work more into his hand of setting me up for that slider or again another fastball up in the zone so you know again it's just you know checking off or canceling out pitches um and you know again when i got to o2 or one two or what it was he threw two fastballs in he missed um and i think just recognizing those fastballs early when having my foot down i don't know it just kind of helped me out with my timing and then it got to 3-2 where he threw in two sliders. I fouled it off. Actually, it was the 2-2 fastball that I ripped down third baseline that really kind of, I had that, you know, we always talk about hitters having a feeling um, or having that feeling of hips or everything in sync. And so after I hit that fastball down the line, it was more like, all right, that felt really good. I got, I got to that, I got my barrel to that fastball and it was like, all right, well, he can't sneak another fastball by me. So it was more just, all right, let's sit on the slider, let's get it up. And so I fouled off some pitches, um, and then I ended up getting a one that was a little more over the plate, and I just kept telling myself, you know, just, just keep two hands on the bat and uh, just make sure you uh, follow through on your swing. I didn't want to cut off my swing. If I got a slider, that was my pitch, to then just either roll over to short or roll over to third. So. Very simple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, that is that is the mind. That was my favorite the, radio call of the year, Steve. That that hit that he had. That was my favorite interview. I didn't do much. It was my favorite interview. Uh, that is the mind of J.D. Davis. That is why you've been as successful as you are. It's like the Sean McVay of of yeah, MLB I, right now. Kind of is, yeah. Um, so. And listen, tonight you're facing Clayton Kershaw. So we've taken up enough of your prep time. Uh, yes. I think you should go go figure <laughs> out a game plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go figure out a game plan for that guy. Um, and I guess at this point, try and be ready just for for first pitch right? because yeah. we've uh, right. we got a lot to cover. But JD right. Davis, thanks so much, man. This is no great. Really. Appreciate, Thank it. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.